Last time I was talking to you about the, uh, the world of Homer from the side of the, uh, you might say, the life the, of the mind rather than the uh, practical matters <coughs> of society, <coughs> talking about values and ethics <coughs> in the world of Homer. And I spoke to you about the heroic ethic, <coughs> which is, <coughs> excuse me, the dominant <coughs> element in this system of theirs. <coughs> uh, another way of looking at it is that it is an aristocratic <coughs> way of thinking <coughs> and feeling. At the core of it is the concept of arete, A-R-E-T-E. -E. Now, that's a word that causes us some problems because <coughs> it comes to mean in <coughs> Even in antiquity, it comes to mean something quite different, and especially if uh, you're talking about Christianity, which adopts the word as well, where it comes to mean goodness, goodness in a kind of a Christian sense. Well, erase all of those ideas from your head when you think about the world of Homer, and I would say the world of Greece uh, in the period we're studying it. Arete derives from the Greek word aner, which means man, man as opposed to woman. <coughs> These are the masculine qualities as the Greeks saw them. <coughs> and the primary among them was the idea of courage, physical courage, moral courage, mental courage, many, mainly courage in battle <coughs> is the most core aspect of this word, this idea, which comes to spread and to be much more encompassing than that. <coughs> um, the idea, I guess the most neutral way to translate the word is excellence, prowess, the ability to do something or to be something which is admired uh, in the fullest way possible. <coughs> Some of the desired qualities, some of the examples of arete are courage, as I've said, but also beauty, strength, the ability to perform athletics very well, but also to speak very well. And it is one of the extraordinary things, I think, for <coughs> modern people to see uh, there are really sort of two central heroes in the poems of Homer. Achilles, <coughs> the great central figure of the Iliad, who represents uh, physical courage, strength, power, beauty, speed, all of those things. Odysseus, in, uh, the hero of the Odyssey, but present and very important in both poems, he has also got all of these things, but the thing that sets him apart, that makes him the special kind of hero he is, is his skill in speech, which doesn't mean only that he pronounces words very well <coughs> or that he selects them very well for beauty or something, but rather that he is enormously clever, that he can use speech <coughs> to achieve practical ends just as he uses strength and power and all those other things. And the Greeks regard, in the Homer's world, seem to regard one just about as well as they do the other. Odysseus is the man, the wily Odysseus, as Homer calls him, <coughs> the man of many devices. All of those things are, are great. Uh, and they are equally honored, uh, along with the physical courage that is so characteristic of these guys. And the recognition of that, those qualities, the recognition of the aretai that these heroes have is what their lives are all about. <clears throat> First of all, they have to have these qualities. It's not enough. They must be recognized by the people among whom they live, by the communities in which they live. And the highest rewards that individuals can have is the recognition of their fellow men of their very, very high qualities. <clears throat> we are talking about um, a society, therefore, 
the anthropologists have come up with, I think, a useful distinction. Uh, societies <coughs> based on shame as opposed to those that practice guilt. Guilt is something very internal and personal. Shame is something very external <coughs> and public. And how you are treated and greeted uh, is what makes your worth. And so it is uh, from the beginning, <coughs> A society in which the community is a critical element, maybe the critical element, an individual who didn't live in a society could not achieve the kinds of glory and fame and recognition <coughs> that you expect <coughs> from a hero. <coughs> and all of these heroes are aristocrats in the traditional sense of the word. They arrive at their high standing <coughs> in their community <clears throat> by virtue of birth. <clears throat> you are born to be one of these people because your father was such a person, belonging to the right families, and so on. <clears throat> the noble families of Greece, and we see it already in Homer, typically claim descent from some god or other, and ordinary people do not have that ability. <clears throat> The family and the individual are <clears throat> the critical elements. A larger community, meaning your entire village, your entire city, <clears throat> your entire region, that is barely mentioned. That is not talked about. Again, think about Achilles. <clears throat> when he refuses to do what he's supposed to, uh, what, uh, he's, uh, to fight with the Greeks because he's had to fight with Agamemnon, nobody says, <clears throat> wait a minute, that's treason. You can't do that. You've been signed up by your city or by this expedition to fight, and you've got to fight. Nobody says that. What they say is, oh, please, we need you, Achilles. You mustn't do this. But nobody says, uh, arrest that man. He has uh, broken his uh, debt. He's not performing his debt to the community. Everybody knows. All those heroes are there because they want to be. And they want to be there so that they can earn both the, uh, uh, the wealth that can be taken from a defeated city, but even more important, the kind of fame and glory that comes with such deeds. And you already, I've already told you the story about Achilles having the choice of uh, living forever without fame or dying with fame, and he makes the choice for death and fame. That, I think, is very critical. <clears throat> that attitude that point of view, even after the world of Homer is gone, <clears throat> remains a very powerful influence on the Greeks throughout the rest of their history. So that you have built into that society an inherent conflict. After all, even these heroes need communities in which to live for all the various purposes that human beings do. <clears throat> so you would think they have to have some allegiance to them. They do, but they also have an allegiance to their families and to themselves, which in Homer tend to predominate. And yet there is a sense in which the, the conflict is very real. If you look at the problem in Homer, uh, Achilles, when he withdraws and refuses to fight for the army, nobody can tell him to do otherwise. He has a right to do that. But that means that something is wrong. And it's very clear that he has been overcome by rage. And he is not behaving in the sensible way that even a Greek hero is supposed to. And he is not brought back to normal, to a position in which people can say, yes, well, you're a great hero and you're not out of your mind. Because when that happens, when he gives up his rage and he allows, you remember, Priam to bury his son, Hector, something he would have refused to do in his rage. So that even Achilles has got to come to terms with the community norms in order to be living in a proper life. And this conflict between his family and private desires and needs and those of the community will be characteristic very strongly of the Greek way of life for the rest of its history, not always in precisely this same form, but it will be there. Competition, again, is rearing its head. Uh, it's another form of competition, the competition between these two 
sources of value, the community at large <coughs> versus the individual and the uh, family. And this kind of tension, which doesn't make it clear the rules are not absolute. Not everybody fits into a pigeonhole. It is not easy to say what is the right thing, what is the wrong thing. All of that creates confusion, problems, but also uh, and, and, you know, conflict, tension, competition, all those things. But it also creates a degree of freedom which doesn't permit the typical despotic kind of culture which characterizes almost all of the human experiences that we know in the early history of the human race. <coughs> so there is, uh, I want to turn now to the way in which this way of thinking <coughs> had an impact on the future. Uh, and of course, I'm speaking about the future of, the, of Western civilization, which was the heir to this tradition. <coughs> I mentioned to you already last time that in a way, the uh, the poems are a kind of a Bible. It is the source of all knowledge and wisdom that anybody who knows anything knows, and, um, and how they were used for practical purposes, as when the Spartans made a decision about who owned Salamis based on what it said in the Iliad. But it's also important to realize how <coughs> those poems inspired the imagination of Greeks for the rest of their history, uh, another fact is that we are told that when Alexander the Great went out to conquer the Persian Empire, <coughs> and as far as he was concerned, to conquer everything he could reach, <coughs> he carried with him a copy of the Iliad, which it is alleged he put under his pillow. This is a problem when you consider that books in those days were not likely to be codexes, codices as they are today, but uh, scrolls that took up quite a lot of space. I don't know quite how Alex managed it, but <laughs> that's what they say. But the principle is established. It was clear he was another Achilles <coughs> in his own eyes. <coughs> and it was for him <coughs> to achieve the great deeds that uh, I have been mentioning. Now, <coughs> if you look at the story of Western civilization, <coughs> it provides a very interesting <coughs> contrast within it. And uh, the, I'm sorry, I, the, the Greek experience that I'm talking about now, based upon what you see in Homer, provides a contrast with and a competition to the other great tradition <coughs> of Western civilization, which is the Judeo-Christian tradition. <coughs> and I just want to make a few small points to indicate how that works. The Iliad begins, the first word in the Iliad is the accusative noun, menin. It's wrath, anger. I am singing about the wrath, the anger of Achilles, which brought so many men to their doom, is what Homer says. The first thing is the emotion of an individual man. <coughs> the Odyssey begins even more strikingly with the word andra, the accusative of aner, the, the accusative uh, case of a man. And, and he says, sing to me, goddess, about that man, that man of many devices, that, that clever man, <coughs> Odysseus. The Aeneid of Virgil, based, of course, on the Iliad and the Odyssey, <coughs> begins, arma virumque cano, I sing of arms, and the man, the man Aeneas. Now that's, what are the Greeks to talking about? I'm talking about individual men, extraordinary men, <coughs> and the events that emerge from uh, them and the life they lead. Well, let's look at our Bible. Begins, this will be news to most of you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it, it, um, the, the book goes right on to talk about God, what he does, sometimes why he does it, what is the effect of what he does, but the center of our book is God, not man. <coughs> and there's some, it's not just an accident that reveals the characteristic of each one of these cultures. The Greeks had a humanistic 
outlook on life. They believed in the gods, they were religious people, but the core of their lives was shaped by things human in a way different from what was true of the Hebrews and the Christians later on. Um, versus a divine view. The secular approach is very, very Greek versus a religious approach. The Greek view, moreover, presupposes that man lives in society. He is not a creature off by himself. By definition, he necessarily lives in society. He is conceivable to the Greeks only in a society. The Iliad, which is about a war, uh, immediately is a, a kind of an artificial society put together for the purpose of defeating the Trojans and taking their city. Uh, as I've suggested to you, the values that are the most important are community values, that is to say, uh, the, the reward of good behavior is the admiration and the honor that a hero gets, and the most serious punishment <coughs> he can suffer is to be shamed in front of that community. Uh, Aristotle, late, writing late in the Greek tradition, but still powerfully influenced by these kinds of ideas, speaks about man as a, the Greek words are a politikon zoon, and I think the best way to understand it is to think of it as meaning man is a creature who lives in a polis, in a city-state, in a Greek kind of a city-state. And, and, and in the same general passage, he says, a man who is by nature without a polis is either more or less than a man. And what he means by that is if a man is superior to the polis, doesn't need a polis, he is a god, because men need a polis. And if he is beneath the polis, it means he's beneath what it is to be a human being. And that, that tells you just how potent is this concept of the community uh, for the Greeks, and it emerges in its own way from the Iliad and the Odyssey. <coughs> Odysseus also was offered an opportunity to live forever. When he was uh, shipwrecked on the island uh, in, in which uh, the goddess Calypso ruled, she fell in love with Odysseus. This is the fate of great heroes. They are heroic and handsome and fast, and women love them. And uh, uh, she says, just stay with me, and I, you will live forever, and all will be well. And uh, he says, well, you're a very beautiful girl, and I enjoy you a lot, but uh, I got to go back to Ithaca. Now, why does he have to go back to Ithaca? Well, he has a wife uh, he, whom he loves, Penelope, and he has uh, a son whom he has barely seen because he had to go off to Troy almost 20 years ago uh, to fight that battle, and he hasn't been home since. Those are very powerful pulls that we easily do understand, but it's also true that he is the king in Ithaca. And when he returns to Ithaca, he immediately moves into a position of honor and respect, which is a critical part of his own sense of himself, of, the, of what he needs to be what he wants to be. And so, uh, and I always think it's very, very interesting to, we don't have, a, in American society, we don't have an Iliad and Odyssey, we don't have our own Bible, but I think uh, Mark Twain's Huck Finn, is really very, very revealing to see what is so different about us in the modern times from uh, the Homeric world. Huck is, uh, when, when things don't go right for Huck, what does he do? He lights out and wants to get away from society. He wants to go wandering and exploring and on his way almost, and as an individual, rejecting society fleeing for his individualism. And that tradition, as you all know, what, how many examples can we think of it, of works that uh, really project the greatness of being all by yourself and away from people and away from society, that's 
where good things are. The Greeks would have thought you were out of your mind. They, or that you were some kind of a barbarian. But that's okay. People who have never known civil society, people who have never known a world with polis, well, of course, they would do something stupid like that. But th I think that's to, uh, an interesting contrast. <clears throat> and let me carry on with this by talking about the views of society, which are characteristic of the two traditions in Western civilization. What do we see in the Bible? When God decides to invent man, he places him in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden contains, first of all, just Adam. And then when God decides, for his own reasons, uh, that he needs a companion, he invents one other companion, Eve. And where they live is paradise. One man, one woman, that's all you need. It's great. Nothing could ever be so good. Well, what happens? They are transgress. Um, Eve persuade, persuaded by the serpent, then persuades Adam to do what was forbidden by God. What is forbidden by God? It is to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, because if a human beings obtain knowledge, they will be like the gods. And that is unacceptable. So when you do that, you have to be punished. What is punishment? To be thrown out of Eden. To be thrown out of this isolated condition of perfection. But what does perfection mean? You don't have to work. You can eat without doing anything about it. You don't seem to do much of anything, which is fine. Everything is quiet, peaceful, no problems, no action. That's paradise. A Greek would go crazy at the thought. It is a pre-social, a pre-political life. Life in society, which then is what Adam and Eve have to encounter. They now have to have form villages, cities, start living among each other, and so on. That is the punishment for the sin of seeking knowledge of good and evil, and therefore of uh, straining for divinity. Man, the message I think is, must know his place, which is humble and not close to divine. His hope rests simply with God, not with himself. When he tries to take things into his own hands and in the process to contravene the will of God, only terrible things can happen to him. It's very interesting, I think, that in the 18th century, Rousseau, who himself seems to me to have been uh, a kind of like a poisoned apple in the history of the human race, oddly revives that biblical view, if you think about it. His view is man was happy and good before the invention of society, which society corrupts man and takes away from him his happiness. Uh, what we need to do is to uh, undo the evils that organized society have done. And if only we removed all of the bad things created by society, man would return to his naturally perfect, virtuous self, which is, of course, a major source of individualism, which is uh, this great Western force, and the nihilism that I think inevitably emerges from it. I think, you know, people have in different ways found in Rousseau the root both of a Nietzschean nihilism and of Marx. And I think there is powerful uh, reason to do so because you can go uh, in either one of those directions once you start making this uh, kind of assumption. For the Greeks, on the other hand, as I've said, political society was essential for living any kind of a good life. In the uh, Odyssey, you remember, uh, Odysseus finds himself uh, on the island of the Cyclopes, those one-eyed monsters. And um, what is it about them that make them so monstrous, so inhuman from the perspective of the Homeric heroes? And here's the line that uh, Homer writes. 
They live without the word, is, the Greek word is nomoi, which we would translate uh, as laws, but before they become laws, they are the customary norms of society. In other words, civilization. They live without nomoi, and they wreck not of one another. That is to say, each family lives by itself. They have nothing to do with each other. They do not have a community. They do not have a society. So they are, of course, sort of prehistoric monsters as far as uh, the Greeks are concerned. Now, the Judeo-Christian story, as I think of it, by the way, the word story is a translation, or I mean, it means the same thing as the Greek word mythos, our word myth. A myth, in this sense, as the Greeks, it's just a tale. It can be true, it can be false, uh, and so on. Anyway, the Judeo-Christian story says, in the beginning, men were innocent. Innocent was the same as ignorant, because knowledge gets in the way of their innocence. And they have solitude, living in paradise. What destroys their happy, permanent condition is the sin of pride. And the consequence of that sin is uh, society, corruption, pain, and death, because they knew neither of these, uh, neither pain nor death, while they were in Eden. Salvation is available, and with it, immortality. But it comes from God, and it doesn't come in the world in which we live, but in some other world to be achieved in the future. That, I think, is a very uh, thumbnail sketch of the Judeo-Christian story. The Greek story is quite different. War is right at the center of it. And war itself requires political and social organization. There can be fighting without war, but there can be no war without uh, an organization that makes it something more than just plain fighting. It requires political and social organization. The search for honor and glory are at the root of why men fight uh, and why they do many, many other things in their lives, according to this view. The Greeks did have a notion that, in a way, resembles some of the things I've said about the Judeo-Christian story. They had a concept called hubris, H-Y-B-R-I-S, to be translated as something but among these terms, excess, arrogance, Violence. I think the fullest grasp of it, I think, might be rendered best by violent arrogance. Some notion of being above yourself and thinking yourself more than a man with the implication that you are approaching some kind of divinity by being more than a man and acting accordingly, which usually requires that you use violence to achieve what you want. <coughs> and the the sort of the standard picture in Greek ethics runs this way. A man is uh, granted too much. He is too well off. He is too rich. He is too strong. He's too beautiful. So much so that he becomes uh, too arrogant and is ready to step beyond his human condition. At that point, the gods don't like it because like the, the Judeo-Christian God, they want to have some boundary between the two, but for them, it's very important because it's not so, the boundary is far from clear. So what happens to the man who has uh, too much? He is afflicted with the hubris, which leads him to take the violent action. Onto the scene comes the goddess Ate, A-T-E, which might be translated moral blindness. In other words, he no longer can think straight, and so he will do something dangerous, harmful, and very uh, ultimately bad for himself. And when he does whatever it is, he is struck by Nemesis, the goddess of retribution. Well, of course, the most famous Greek case, I think, of these things is in uh, Sophocles' play Oedipus the King, uh, which illustrates it perfectly well. Oedipus is a brilliant man. He achieves the kingship of his city because of his extraordinarily, extraordinary intelligence. 
And he's a very good man. He is king, don't imagine that he's a despot, anything but, the people love him. He saved the city, thanks to his brilliance and his goodwill. Uh, however, after a while he comes to be too satisfied, too comfortable with his own brilliance. And when another threat comes to the city, he is confident that he can solve the problem again for his people. He's warned by the gods through seers and by men of wisdom saying, don't, don't, don't investigate this question too far. He might be making a mistake. He won't listen. He bulls ahead. And uh, he discovers in the process the terrible, terrible truth, which is that uh, by accident, by coincidence, not by intent, but that as a young man, he killed his father and subsequently married his mother. And this most horrible uh, of combinations of facts drives him, uh, he, and he's already suffered from uh, the uh, hubris and the ate, and the retribution is terrible in his, uh, what to say, in, in his madness when he discovers that he, he tears out his own eyes blinds himself, and of course now for the rest of his life he must just go about as a kind of a beggar, uh, having been this form tremendously great king. <coughs> so these are examples of what happens in, in Greek ethics later on uh, if you are guilty of this characteristic. On the other hand, when he even Oedipus himself, when he understands and he relents and in a sense he <coughs> apologizes for what he's done, but more importantly, he ceases, of course, to be powerful and to act in that way, wisdom comes to him. He understands he has acted immoderately. That is the critical concept. Moderation is this wonderfully great, important thing for the Greeks. You must act in moderation. <coughs> Don't be they don't ask you to just be humble and throw yourself on the ground and consider yourself as nothing compared to the God or the gods. <clears throat> be a man, be proud of what you should be proud of, but don't go beyond limit of what is human, because if you do, <clears throat> terrible things will come. Seek fame, we all want that, and I'll say more about that, but uh, you can't push it too far. There has to be uh, some kind of a reasonable human limit to what you do. So here is this problem, a typically Greek problem, where there is a contradiction that you've got to live with, you can't resolve. You, as, if you want to seek the fullness of a human experience, you have to try to be the best possible man, the greatest possible man to compete successfully against others and to achieve fame, glory, and recognition for what you've achieved. But if you push it too far, you will anger the gods and something terrible will happen to you. <laughs> so it seems to me that Western civilization ever since has been a composite of these two traditions, but there is no way to put them together. And so Western civilization is an ambiguous society with a war always ranging within the soul of Western civilization. Uh, and it's never perfectly clear which of the two approaches to life uh, is the better one. I don't know whether any of you have ever thought about this in anything like this way. <clears throat> but if you contemplate your own uh, way of thinking about what, you're, what are you supposed to be doing with your life, I think you'll find some combination if you're sort of typical, uh, but that combination doesn't ever have to be 50-50 and it, I'm sure it very rarely is. More typically, one aspect of the culture dominates rather than the other, uh, but the shifts in place and time and in many, I would say throughout most human beings, there is a consciousness of the both. They both have some attraction and one has to grapple with them. So the part of you wants to become the greatest whatever it is that you want to become. And you wouldn't be here if you weren't very competitive and very eager to come out first uh, 
devoted to arete in your own version of that kind of thing. And yet, it's very easy to say to you, that's not a good thing to do. That's what you should try to do is to be humble. You should be like uh, uh, what Jesus uh, suggests uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there's, there's, your soul is in deep danger if you indeed continue to lead the life that you have mainly been leading up to now. And those two things are in conflict. Well, I don't care if you ever go to church. That is no longer confined to a religious uh, organization. Those are key parts float around in Western civilization all the time. There are aspects of uh, demand for performance at the highest level, and at the same time as there's a great deal of blaming people for pursuing such things instead of humility. That's Western civilization, friends, and the Greeks uh, are at the root of the whole thing. So now, let me turn to my next uh, topic, which is to leave the world of Homer behind us and to begin to tell the story of how it was that the characteristic uh, unit of Greek civilization, the polis, came into being <coughs> out of the Dark Ages uh, we've said a little bit about. <coughs> Let me say a little bit, first of all, about the way scholars have categorized uh, the history of Greece. Uh, typically, we speak of the Bronze, Bronze Age, the Mycenaean period, and so on, followed by the Dark Ages. But after that, you start having refined terms which uh, derive actually, excuse me, from the world of the history of art. And that is because in the Dark Ages, we don't have any writing. So if you want to designate anything, it has to be by uh, tangible things like pottery, particularly. Painted pottery when you have it, because it's easier to categorize. And it's from that that most of our terms show up. So for instance, you will see uh, references to words like uh, proto-geometric. Post, they'll be sort of post-Mycenaean, then proto-geometric. These would be the very earliest uh, kinds of pots that have geometric designs on them. Then comes the geometric period and uh, the orientalizing period. All of these refer to uh, pottery styles. Uh, but there is, uh, you then next come to a, a larger period, which is uh, referred to as the archaic period. <laughs> archaic vis-a-vis -vis the classical period, which is the, the start was the central subject of people's interest in the Greeks to begin with, and later on they studied its surrounding periods. <coughs> This archaic period is, roughly speaking, about 750 B.C. to 500 B.C. Why this period as a unit? What makes it a unit? Well, it's around 750. Uh, a great number of the changes that move the Greeks away from the Dark Age kind of society to the full-scale polis begin. And 500, because really I would have said if you were being more, a little bit more precise, you would say something like, uh, well, no, even 500 isn't really bad. Because if you think about the Persian Wars as being the breaking point, before the Persian Wars, you're in the Archaic period. After the Persian Wars, you're in the Classical period. Well, the Persian Wars begin in 499 BC when Miletus uh, starts the Ionian Rebellion. So that's really, I think, the reason for the dating. During this archaic period, some of the things that happen are these. The isolation of the Greek towns in the Dark Age gives way, increasingly, to contact <coughs> with the East and the South. I'm, when I say the South, I really mean Egypt, uh, and all around the Eastern Aegean Sea. Uh, the rise of the polis is based upon critical economic, military, social, and political changes, all of which produce a world that's really strikingly different from the one that was just before it. I suppose the first apparently historical event that we know something about is the, f the first Olympic 
Games, which according to Greek tradition were held in 776 BC. The precision of that, of course, is not to be taken seriously. <coughs> but it gives you a general idea of when we are talking about. And uh, the fact, this is what's interesting about that, is the, the Olympic Games, like all of the Panhellenic Games, it was the first of the Panhellenic Games, was not a local event just for one polis and maybe for a couple. It was one to which all the people who thought of themselves as Hellenes, which we would call Greeks, uh, took part in. So that meant the concept that there is something that all of us are, have in common that make us all Hellenes now exists. It's not there in Homer. So that's one thing. <clears throat> then literacy returns to the Greek world. It is, as I told you before, not a development of the Mycenaean script, uh, which we saw, but rather a new writing system, a true alphabet. Most of the symbols were borrowed from a kind of a, of a Semitic language and a Semitic alphabet that came from uh, Phoenicia, I would have guessed, or someplace near it. <clears throat> I think I mentioned to you that the Greeks uh, improved upon it, made it a true alphabet by taking some signs that they didn't need for their own language and turning them into vowel signs. You know, if you read a, uh, well, a good example of that kind of a Semitic script is Hebrew. If you read biblical Hebrew, you have to supply the vowels yourself. You have to know where the vowels are supposed to go. But <clears throat> from here, and that makes it harder to learn how to read. Well, when you have the vowel sounds, it's easier. And the Greeks made that contribution. Um, in a, one of Plato's lesser known dialogues, he, he makes a statement, the following statement, which I think shows both the typical arrogance of the Greeks and also says something true. <clears throat> he says, the Greeks never invented anything, but everything they borrowed, they improved upon. Um, I think they probably also invented a few things, but it was very, very characteristic of the Greeks. <clears throat> to borrow from the cultures they encountered and to adapt them to make them more useful for their own purposes. And nothing could be clearer than that the alphabet is uh, an example of that. Henceforth, we will see writing in Greece. Now, very, very little of it. <clears throat> and of course, what we have is confined uh, to things that are not perishable. These would have been inscriptions either on pottery, which the earliest ones are, <clears throat> or on stone. But otherwise, I'm sure there was writing on perishable material, wooden plaques, um, I, probably not yet paper. But, but these would have been destroyed. So what we have is on the pottery. <clears throat> we know that the Greeks established the first, the first colony of which we know the Greeks, that the Greeks did establish it, was uh, in the Bay of Naples on the island of Ischia. They, established a colony somewhere in the 750s. And soon afterwards, <coughs> there is a colony established on the east coast of Sicily at what we call Syracuse now, <coughs> and a, a rash of others. So that the Greeks are in the 750s engaged in spreading themselves from the mainland of Greece and from the Aegean in general, even so far out west as Italy and Sicily, and soon we know they are in touch with just about every place in the Mediterranean Sea. In the same period, there is clear-cut, unmistakable, oriental influence on Greek pottery and other things that they make. <clears throat> what oriental? That means mainly the uh, Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, Syria, all those older civilizations uh, and more, much more advanced civilizations than the Greek. The Greeks are in touch with them again, and they borrow styles, copy styles. Maybe they, in the early days, maybe they uh, used some of the craftsmen from out there, or maybe they just, their own craftsmen picked it up. But however that may be, no question about it. Contact, interaction, influence. Most of the influence, I suspect, was going one way in those days. 
from the more advanced civilizations of the East to the Greeks. The Greeks are doing a lot of learning, borrowing, and adopting. <clears throat> and of course, this is the period in which the Homeric epics are finally written down, now that there is writing. And that gives them, I think, even greater impact on the uh, Greek world in the future. All of these things are happening about the same time as there is a also happening a major fundamental change in farming, commerce, and warfare, which will have very significant political consequences as well, but I want to postpone that story for a little while. <coughs> Let me then just t turn to this phenomenon that is the polis. The polis, is, the word polis appears in Homer, as early as Homer, when it means something different from what it means uh, throughout most of Greek history. It just means a physical place. And what it appears to be is the citadel, the fortress that was the center of the towns that grew up after the Bronze Age, after the collapse of the Mycenaean world. So that's how it is in Homer. Later definitions, however, will be expansive and broad, and as you go further and deeper into Greek history, the claims become greater and greater. Uh, Aristotle, in his politics, of course, tells us the most on this subject, and often he is our source of information. But one thing is clear and pretty early. The polis is not merely a city-state in the same way as let us say the Mesopotamian city-states of the third millennium BC were places like Ur or Kish, towns that we know back there. Th those places were simply the place where the king or the emperor ruled, the place where the main god's uh, palace was, uh, the place where the bureaucrats were to do their business, that's, that's what it was, no more than that. But immediately, very early, you start hearing the Greeks talk about the polis in terms that are more in your mind than in, in, the, in your church. <clears throat> Sixth century Greek poet named Alcaeus wrote, not houses finely roofed or the stone of walls well built, no, not canals or dockyards make the polis, but men able to use their opportunity. And uh, if you get into the fifth century, late in the fifth century, Thucydides in his history has one of his uh, generals speak to his uh, men and say, men are the polis. So we need to straighten out for ourselves, what does that mean uh, does that mean that the place where these people live is not the polis? Is it only men? Uh, well, we'll come back to that. Let me read you something as we move to the fullest claims that will be made for the role of the polis, Aristotle in the politics. He says this, as man is the best of the animals when perfected, so he is the worst of all when he is divided away from law and justice. But, he tells us, human justice can be found only in the polis. Because, he says, man is by nature a politikon zoon, an animal of the polis. And as I told you, a man who is without a polis by nature is above or below the category of man. Because man alone has the faculty of speech and the ability to distinguish good from bad and right from wrong. While he is born with weapons for the use of wisdom and virtue, he may use them for the opposite ends. Therefore, when he is without virtue, man is the most savage of animals. Justice, on the other hand, is an element of the polis. The administration of justice, which means deciding what is just, is the regulation of the partnership, which is the polis. 
Man can't live without the polis. Justice exists only in the polis. The polis is something more than a place. It's more than the walls. It's more than the ships. It's, it is some kind of a thing that is spiritual, it seems to me. <clears throat> But about the size of this thing. Oh, no, let me back up. Uh, there's something else I wanted to say um, to indicate this notion of men being the polis as opposed to anything tangible. Um, when the Persians conquered the Greek cities of Asia Minor, when they came to the coastal city of Phocia, the Phocians had a choice of either giving bread and water to the great king and becoming subjects to the Persians. All it would have meant was they would have had to pay taxes and do military service for the king. He didn't go about killing people he conquered. They chose instead to take their city, which is to say all the people in the city, put them on ships, sail to the far west, and organize a new city out there. And in fact, they landed uh, on the Riviera in France and did pretty well for themselves afterwards. Um, but that's a beautiful example. They thought they had taken their polas with them because they had moved the entire city there. Uh, during the, the uh, Persian Wars, when uh, Themistocles is trying to convince his fellow Greeks to stay and fight at Salamis, but they are reluctant to do so. So he says, okay, <clears throat> if you won't stay and fight it, uh, Salamis. Well, all our men are already located on our ships. We will take these ships, sail them away to Italy, and settle in Athens in Italy. Well, the Spartans take them very seriously, and they say, okay, we'll stay and fight at Salamis. So such a concept was a possibility. It's not the whole story, though. Let me turn to the question of the physical picture that you ought to have of a polis. Remember, there is that citadel standing on an, a high hill, the Acropolis, as it's called, the polis up high. There is surrounding farmland going as far, typically, as there is either a natural or an artificial frontier. Typically, a mountain range will be the boundary between the area of two poles, or a stretch of water, because Greece has the sea winding through it everywhere. Uh, but when that's not true, then there is a typical sort of modern frontier, a, a land bridge, which then a line is, a theoretical line is drawn through it, and on one side is one city, and the other side is another city. It's a wonderful uh, archaeological discovery of a boundary stone uh, up in the, near Athens, uh, which in, on which uh, is written on one side, this is Athens, it is not Megara. On the other side it says, this is Megara, it is not Athens. So there is that kind of a boundary as well. And that is a place where trouble is likely to emerge. Greeks, will, once the polis are in place, they will spend a great deal of time fighting each other. A normal reason for fighting is a dispute about a piece of land that is more or less on the boundary between them. And so that's one aspect of their world. What about how big are these things? Answer from the 20th century America, very small. I think the word tiny might be justified. We start with the most abnormal of them in this respect, the largest polis of which we know, it's Athens. Unlike many uh, polis, Athens had been successful in gaining, the city of Athens itself had been successful in gaining control of the whole region which it dominated, the region of Attica, so that anybody, by the time history dawns, Anybody who lives in the peninsula that is Attica is an Athenian. Even if he lives in a village or a good-sized town 60 miles away, he is still an Athenian. He can be a citizen of his community. He can be a Marathonian. 
but he's also, and more primarily, he, uh, he is an Athenian. Now, Attica was, uh, is, in fact, approximately a thousand square miles, which I'm told is about the size of Rhode Island. And that's the biggest polis of which we know. Um, there are well over a thousand polis. Some people want to push the number at its height up to maybe 1,500, but it doesn't matter. You're talking about lots and lots of them. What is the typical uh, size of them? What is the typical population of them? Well, Aristotle and Plato, both sort of theoreticians of the polis, each had an idea what's the right size for a, the perfect polis. Aristotle said the right size is a place where all of the citizens, by which he meant the male adult citizens, could come to a central place and hear a speaker. And that number comes out to be about 5,000 male adults. <laughs> Plato, being a mathematician, as Aristotle was not, decided that the perfect polis would have 5,040 citizens. Why 5,040, you may ask? Do we have any mathematicians among us who will give me a quick answer to that? Yeah. Say it again. I don't even know what that means. That's how good a mathematician <laughs> I am. Tell me, does it mean the same thing as it has the greatest number of uh, numbers that go into it equally? That's the answer I heard. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, yeah, did somebody say anything? No, all right, fine. Enough of this mathematical folderol. As you can see, I don't understand it. But look, here's the point. We're talking about 5,000 adult males. That's the ideal polis as far as these guys are concerned. Athens was not the ideal polis. It was big. How many men did it have in its fullest uh, bloom? Somewhere between 40 and 50,000. Uh, it's impossible to have a better guess than that. Um, then if you want to say how many human beings lived in Attica when the greatest uh, number did, we are speaking about something between a quarter of a million and 300,000. But you have to understand just from what I've already told you, this is extraordinarily large. And I think uh, you must realize that most polis, if you're thinking about a thousand or more polis, would have been well under 5,000 adult male citizens. So I, I, I just wanted to give you uh, an idea of just how small most of these places are, as well as indicating sharp departures. <coughs> Okay, now the polis from the beginning, and it never stopped being the, what I'm about to say, chiefly agricultural communities. Most of the people, and I think it's reasonable to guess that a very high majority of the people would be living on farms, engaged in farming, feeding themselves and the rest of the community. Unlike the ancient Near Eastern cities, these towns do not grow up around a temple or a marketplace, confluence of rivers as they do in medieval Europe. No, they grow up like the Athenian does, right smack in the middle of a plain, uh, which is a good place for farming with a great high acropolis available. Even the characteristic thing in Apollos, the agora, the marketplace, which is also becomes the civic center of these towns. Even these grew up later than the polis. They show up a century or more typically after we know that there's a polis there. <laughs> and the agora comes about in a gradual way. I think we you should never imagine in these real old polis that got the thing started that somebody said, let's have a polis. Uh, Things just happen. They just grew up. One nice way to, if you think, uh, here Athens is helpful. 
Uh, how many of you ever been to Athens? Raise your hand. Yeah, and the rest of you, when, when you go, uh, on the north shore, <laughs> north slope of the Acropolis, beyond the Agora, there is the, uh, the area of uh, Athens known as the Plaka. It's the oldest inhabited area in Athens. And there you will find that, unlike the more modern Athens, which has streets laid out at 90 degrees angles perfectly, uh, it's a mess. I mean, the, the streets wind around, and, the, and that's because the original streets were f followed the way the cattle did their wandering, looking for food, and then they, that became the roads. So you, you have to, I, I want to stress the sense of natural development, not some kind of a central authority making a decision about anything. It is also pretty clear that for some time after the foundation of the polis, there were no city walls. These were not defended. Your, your farmland was not defended. Uh, if you had a house outside the Acropolis, as you would, it was not defended. What happened if the town was attacked, invaded? Everybody who could ran up to the Acropolis to defend himself. So that's how things were in the elementary phase. Now, there are Greek traditions uh, that are taken seriously by the Greeks that suggest that kings ruled these cities from the beginning. And they have lists of kings with their names and sometimes with stories attached to them. <coughs> And I think myself that there were people who had the title Basileus. And they were noblemen, and that they had some kind of a position of influence and authority in the state. But as I think we have seen already, they were not kings in the Oriental sense. And once we have a polis, it looks as though we don't have kings any longer in any shape, manner, or form. What the kind of regime that emerges alongside the polis is an aristocratic republic in which the noblemen have influence and power within the community by tradition, and they are plural. There is not one real king. There, are, there is typically a council of aristocrats that is the outfit that counts. Hesiod, whom I have not mentioned to you before, a poet who we think to have lived around 700 BC, very early in the history of the polis, um, wrote one of his poems uh, called The Works and Days is Advice to Farmers on How to Live, but it also contains a story in which Hesiod talks about himself and the quarrel he has with his brother <coughs> over who inherits what from the father. And he claims he's been cheated out of his inheritance, inheritance because his brother bribed the uh, judges. Well, who are these judges? He calls them basileis, kings. These would have been these aristocratic figures who we know in the earliest days of the polis they were the judicial authority, basing that on their claim to divine descent, on their certainly noble descent, and on the fact that the nobility <coughs> had a monopoly of knowledge about what the traditions of the community are. So, but uh, Hesiod complains about them and calls them bribe-swallowing basileis, crooked ones, plural, plural, kings, as in Homer. It's also interesting, Athens has a very clear tradition of thinking they had kings. And what is, I think, very telling is the story they, t they give us about how kingship came to an end in Athens. I mean, I just want to, let me start by contrasting it with what I think is fairly typical. <coughs> the Romans also had kings. I think they had probably real kings uh, just before the emergence of their republic. And the, that, uh, kingship came to an end according to the Roman story, and uh, the Republic uh, succeeded it when one of the kings, the last one, Tarquinius Superbus, Superbus in Latin means arrogant, uh, Tarquinius misbehaved, 
most seriously by raping the daughter of a nobleman, Lucretia. That caused a rebellion and they overthrew the kings. And thereafter, the word king was a dirty word in Roman history. Uh, the best example is uh, when Julius Caesar has made himself master of Rome, but he's still behaving as though the Republic exists. Uh, people either who want to embarrass him, well, yes, I think people who want to embarrass him, send around the uh, story, Caesar is, wants to make himself king. The word for king in uh, Latin is rex. And so he, he, he tried to diffuse that with a pun by saying, non sum rex said Caesar. I'm not rex, I'm not king, I'm not rex. My name is Caesar. Well, in fact, he pretty well was ready to turn himself into a king, but he wouldn't use that word. He wouldn't use that word because it had such a terrible smell. Kings were despots, dictators, rapists. They were not, you didn't want to be one. Well, look at the story the Athenians tell. <clears throat> um, there was this king of Athens, Codrus was his name. They were, the Athenians were invaded by an army from the outside. Codrus led his forces out against them. He fought brilliantly and bravely and drove the enemy from the field. In the course of the battle, he himself was killed. The Athenians loved and were respected him so much that they gave him the almost unheard of honor of burying him right on the spot where he fell in the field. And thereafter, his name was always followed with glory, admiration, and devotion. Well, what kind of a story is that? Why do you get rid of a kingdom? Why would you get rid of king? Oh, I forgot to tell you the hour. Why did they get rid of the king? Because they thought they could never have another one so good, so why try? Give me a break. <clears throat> no, I think somebody had to make up a story, but the memory of kings was not of a Tarquinius. It was not of a brutal, despotic ruler, because they didn't have any such thing. Uh, we don't know how the change came about, or if some people question if they ever really did have king. But the picture I want you to have is that's not the tradition. The tradition is aristocracy. That's what we connect with the polis. And of course, it was so natural because it also fit into the world of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which they were accustomed to think about. I think that's a, a good place to stop. Next time, I will uh, take up the story of the expansion of the world of the polis, which takes the form of colonization.